So good morning, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my second year at New West, and I hope it's going to be the first or the second of, of another 20. This is a, a great confluence of not only kind of the, the community that is arguably the heartbeat of, of the cannabis world, but it's, it's a community that's also in the middle of technology. So we talked about so the, the cross-pollination of the topics today. Um, I'm thrilled to be with a panel of people that I think can really get to the heart of what is, uh, I think, probably the big issue of the sector right now. At least we'll try to, you know, M&A and global expansion, the cannabis, cannabis industry and investing trends is pretty much in some part touches what everyone is here to, to, to spend two or three days thinking about. And, and it's, it's an extraordinary time, folks, right, for, for what's going on in, in the cannabis industry as an investor um, and as a company. So I want to quickly introduce our panel, who I think have a pretty unique perspective on this, uh, and we'll, we'll dive right into the investment trends. Uh, first, we have Gaynell Rogers, who's, who's founder of uh, Treehouse Global, uh, Sumit Mehta, who's founder and CEO of Mazakali, Scott Hammond, who's head of the MGO uh, ELO Alliance, uh, and here to speak on behalf of that group, uh, Brent Johnson, CEO of the Hoban Law Group, and Wade Diebner, who is the managing partner of XCAPSA Group. Um, and just a little orientation and maybe uh, some context of my background, because uh, I'm both uh, an investor in the industry from a uh, traditional background as a hedge fund manager. I've invested in a lot of public deals, a lot of private deals. Um, I actually run an ETF that's been investing in the space and launched about two months ago into the teeth of a, of a wicked bear market. Um, I actually do uh, a, a strategic advisory work for one of the big institutional hedge funds in the space, JW Asset Management, where we have a dedicated fund. So, um, And I do advisory work for a number of companies in, in, in the sector and, and companies that are going to capital markets that are global, that are evaluating M&A structures every single day. So so um, hopefully I can, you know, keep this conversation moving. So I want to open it up to the group and really uh, talk about, so if, if the headlines, if you parachuted in yesterday uh, between the headlines that uh, MedMen, Pharmacan is, is breaking apart, um, whether it's for HSR and DOJ reasons or whether it's for truly just balance sheet reasons and reasons that are unique to the companies and the problems they may or may not be having themselves, um, you, you come up this morning and you hear that, that Hexo, which has certainly been one of the high profile names in the space because of the relationship they have with Molson Coors and a JV they did and early on when we started to evaluate the strategic uh, multinationals coming into the space, these guys garnered a lot of attention and this morning they tell us they're actually not going to, they're, not only have their, as their guidance for uh, this quarter and for 2019 has been cut by 45%, but that they're pulling all 2020 guidance for, for the outlook of their business, which is alarming, and the stock went down 25% this morning. Um, the Green Organic Dutchman, which was another high-profile Canadian LP who raised a lot of money on a promise of we're going to do this, this, and this, and we're building a brand. And by the way, a company I know very well and do advisory work for, and a group of, I think, very talented, transparent folks um, are... Uh, there's, there's a couple of research reports that they're running out of cash before they can complete their big projects up in Canada. So the table is set, guys, to talk about both the public markets, which are, which are hemorrhaging and going through an extraordinary bear market, and, and the private markets, which are also repricing dramatically, too. So um, I want to I open it up. First of all, you know, Wade, I'll just start with you because there you are. Um, talk to me about how you see, how did we get here? Um, and talk to me about the vision you have as a company uh, who's not only... You're making your own investments, you're on the ground, you, 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 you manage hemp farms, but you're also a steward of capital for your LPs. Uh, no, I appreciate that. So um, how do we got here? So um, you t you're talking about the negative aspect of it or? or I, you know, I mean, <laughs> at some point I want someone to say something positive, but yeah, right no, now no. there's, you know. We, we all know. You can leave that to me. <laughs> yeah. All right, okay, now. You know, it's, it's difficult. I think a lot of fast money, uh, you know, float in the space quickly and they look to make a lot of money quick. And um, there wasn't a lot of corporate governance with these companies in Canada. And, and uh, just the structures weren't set up properly. And, you know, so I, I think that um, we're kind of due for a pullback. Um, so, you know, it's difficult to say why we're here now. I think a lot of it was the, the news on the vapes coming out. I think that right. was played a big deal recently. Um, but, you know, I don't think we have a lot of institutional money following up to kind of create that um, the buying that we need uh, to push it forward. So yeah. there's still not a lot of venture capital firms coming in. There's not a lot of pension funds. There's not a lot of hedge funds investing in the space. So I still think that's um, there's the opportunity on a pullback. But 
Um, so do you, do you, you know, so maybe Sue and I'll bring this to you because you know you act as uh, your group is both a allocator on behalf of institutions and family offices, and you're 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 trying to be that CAO in a very complex, evolving market. Um, talk to you know what institutions are really at work here and and do you see as much as there's we know that there's federal restrictions upon pensions and endowments and getting involved in federally uh, illegal businesses even if they're legal on a state-by-state -state basis talk about the profile of the companies that you think are are in the industry now and the ones that may be knocking on the door are they now are they taking a walk and going to come back you know in a couple of years well thanks Tim we've seen this before and I don't know that this is a, a a repeat, but it certainly is a rhyme of something we've seen in many cycles in the past. So if I think about cannabis as an emerging market, as this market moves toward maturity, the fragmentation that we're seeing with 32,000 private businesses is going to move toward a more oligopolistic structure. If we go back to, I go back to 1999, we had 100 companies that added .com to their names, saw a significant boost in valuation without the expected post-announcement negative drift. And then a year later, from March of 2000, 14 months out, we saw a 78% decline in the NASDAQ. We saw an 80% decline in the home building stocks in 08. So this is not a new thing. If you're a cannabis company today, you've got three options. You can survive, you can get acquired, you can die. And there's not a fourth option. And as we move from fragmentation to oligopoly, a vast majority of this industry is unfortunately going to see something similar to what we saw in the dot-com and the housing boom and bust cycles. Is oligopoly a function of the capital market structure as it is? In other words, there's, there, there is no uh, rational, um, traditional capital markets process. So is uh, oligopoly, uh, that's an interesting observation on where we're going. I think, if anything, right now, we have a highly fragmented, uh, non-concentrated, industry, right, that is trying to consolidate, sometimes out of pain, sometimes positively. So quickly on that, and then I, I want to hear from uh, from Brent, who spent a lot of time as an attorney in, in the middle of the Silicon Valley dot-com bubbles and try to compare them. So quickly, Sumit, though, why oligopoly? Why, why do you think we're going to an oligopoly? If you look at mature markets, you see oligopolistic structures. You see, when, when you're looking at cannabis, first of all, cannabis to me is similar to tech in that tech was an industry. Now you're hard pressed to name one without it. Cannabis is an industry and 10 years from now, I suspect you'll be hard pressed to name an industry that's not been touched by this plant. I also expect that this will be the, mo the best performing asset class when we look out a decade from now. So with that, there's a there's tremendous a amount line. of excitement. There's a tremendous amount of the institutional capital that's kept outside the moat that's been created around the cannabis castle because of the state federal conflict. And as that conflict gets resolved, I expect that money, as you know, flows to its level like water does, uh, we will fill in these gaps. For, from our perspective, from an investment standpoint, it is a very good thing to see that alpha does, gen does lie yeah. currently between what is perceived as a risk and what, what is the actual risk that we see uh, inside the industry. Well, I mean, it, so, so, so I'll come over to Brent, um, who's, uh, whose firm actually is very involved in the sector and also, um, I think, you know, certainly has a view on capital market structures, how the deals are getting done. But you also have, have sat in, in the middle of another, you know, call it a bubble, whatever we want to call this. We all know where obviously technology has moved and it's been um, beyond the expectations of where we were at the bubble time. So people were well founded to be as exuberant as they were. Um, but Brent, um, what Sumit's describing is because is effectively what's been a top-down trade, right? It was a top-down story. It was a legislative moment. It was something that, that was very easy for people to quickly get behind. And on some level, that's what dot-com was, right? So compare and contrast where we are and, and try to, you know, we all can do most of those comparisons. So I, I want to hear from you why this is different and what you see from the companies, either in terms of the maturity of the management teams, the, the opportunity size of the market. We, we clearly are apples and oranges on some level, but we're, we're similar. Uh, yeah, so th uh, thanks, Tim, and appreciate everyone coming this morning. Uh, so I was actually start I started my career in '99 in Silicon Valley at the tail end of the tech boom. So I was there during the rise, and then I learned how to do disillusions very quickly. And so I'm seeing a lot of trends in, in the cannabis space, right? 
uh, there's a lot of uh, high valuations, a lot of uh, unsupported uh, valuations, and it effectively imploded. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that now. You know, if you, I can show you charts of M&A activity in the space. Uh, it's up 40% uh, year over year. Uh, deal sizes are up dramatically. Uh, VC deals are up dramatically, number of deals and deal size. Yet, you know, the, the public markets are tanking. Access to capital is, is tough. So what matters? Uh, what matters is fundamentals. Because I've done a bunch of deals in the last few months, uh, you know, $8 million deals, $24 million deals, tons of deals. And, and the distinction that I make is that these companies actually have strong fundamentals. They have a management team. They have IP in some cases. They have strong financials. They actually have a valuation. They know they, how to build they, a brand. That they can, yeah, they know how to build a brand. They have a valuation that's actually supported by real facts and, and models. And so it's, it's back to the basics. And so if you're a company out there trying to raise money, build a brand, get some IP, uh, build a management team, have a strong financial model, and have a valuation that but you can are support. You see, but I, I hear that. But so it's nice that there's maybe, you know, a, a new level of, of sanity and sobriety. But, I mean, a lot of companies have awful fundamentals right now in the cannabis industry. They have terrible financials. They have no financials. So uh, I'm trying to understand um, where, and, and where do you guys say to a company, this ain't going to cut it, and, and you know, we don't even want to touch you? Because cause as a service provider, um, you know, it's easy just to say, we'll take whatever business we can get. And I'm in no way picking on you guys. In fact, I think you guys are probably able to steer a lot of companies uh, into smarter capital structures and, and maybe even get them to a place where they can invest. So. Um, I don't know. Have we gotten to, is this a sanity check we needed to have? And, and, and are you pushing back on companies saying there's no way this is going to fly? No, I, mean, I think uh, uh, fundamentals are, are becoming key. I mean, for my, guys, my first couple of years in this space, people were throwing money at anything. Uh, no documents, you know, no, no valuations, no, no analysis, no diligence. And I think they're, they're learning the, the lesson that you know, the fundamentals still matter. You've got, you got to dig in. And I think now if you're going to raise money in this space, you got to, you got to have all the pieces in place. And so I do, I do advise our clients, if they don't have a pitch deck, if they don't have an executive summary, if they don't have a solid financial model, you know, we, get, we try to get all those pieces in place before we go out and raise capital. Yeah. So, Scott, and I'm, you know, I'm leaving you last because you've promised to be positive. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to ask Scott because his group is very well versed in tax and advisory and the regulatory environment. And, and, and so a lot of people looked at the announcement yesterday of MedMen and Pharmacan um, as an indictment on the entire industry. That we were actually going to now see that this was a function of the regulators saying, we're not comfortable. Um, we're very concerned about antitrust issues, which, you know, here's my editorial. No one asked for it, but which is absurd. Because, as you said, this is not an industry that's at risk of oligopoly right now. It's an industry that's overly fragmented and needs consolidation for strong teams. So, and frankly, I'm curious your view on that particular deal. If you have one, you don't have to have one. Um, but where do you see HSR and the M&A environment um, uh, from, from what you think the regulators are positioned to, to, to kind of bring to the table? Because my view is actually... There's a lot of negative news around this. I think this is a tailwind for the industry. I actually think that DOJ is your friend um, and is doing a lot of thoughtful work on this. And I don't work for the DOJ, I promise. So, so I'll, I'll certainly address that uh, question, but I'm going to ask your patience for a second. A couple of clarifying items. Uh, I'm a last minute substitute. You were kind enough to introduce me as the head of MGOL Alliance. My boss is actually out in the audience somewhere. To <laughs> see. So Apologies, to avoid boss. a career limiting move, I have to correct. I am the COO of the MGOL Alliance, not the CEO. So with that career saving comment made, hopefully. Um, <laughs> a, a couple of comments. I also can't help but notice that the service providers are always put together because we have to be isolated and kept uh, se you know segmented from the rest it's not it's not it's, it's not it's not safe to let us out in the general public um, and so we, I, I come to this kind of from a unique perspective because as, as Tim alluded my particular background is very much the traditional public accounting uh, done a ton of work with cannabis companies both in terms of early formation the governance the maturation process as well as the go public m a etc but uh, as part of the mjo alliance we also have lo capital which is our I bank so we're seeing the capital markets uh, perspective as well um, from the legal perspective and again always uh, fascinating to have a cpa talk about legal issues so uh, i think you may have to have signed we'll, we'll call you out where you're yeah, just exactly. out of your box yes. uh, yeah it scares me because he's down on the left he's taking notes he's, he's watching me so i think the to your point i think you're right 
I don't think this is a negative. In fact, our perspective on everything that's happened, including MedMen Pharmacan, uh, as somebody said earlier, it's part of the evolution uh, as the industry goes from a very early stage uh, industry to more mature industry. Everything that everybody here has commented is part of that process. Unfortunately, this industry has had to do it much like my child has had to grow up in social media. This industry is, has unfortunately grown up in the public markets, and that's a, because of decisions made by some of the early pioneers instead of, as somebody alluded to, uh, behind the veil of privacy of traditional VC and, and private and angel investment. So it's made the drama seem much more significant. These are normal things. To your point, um, HSR is something that the industry hadn't had to deal with. It wasn't necessarily, I'd say, prepared, I would argue. And Does everybody know what HSR is in the room? Now just raise your hands if you do not, and it's OK. All right, so Scott, quickly explain what's going on here because this I would love to have the the lawyer on the group. So anyway, HSR is if you're if you're deal and please back me if I if I screw this up. So uh, HSR is a regulatory review for antitrust. Uh, anti-competitive issues that comes into play if a merger exceeds certain thresholds, the, the dollar value, excuse me, that threshold varies a little bit. I think right now it's around 800 to 900 million, 879 or something like that. So it's a relatively large threshold. Two or three years ago, you, you did not see deals approach that threshold because the valuations were smaller, entities were smaller. So even if you applied very high multiples, you weren't seeing as many deals hit that threshold. A whole sl uh, slug of high value deals came to the market over a short period of time, late in 18, I'd say early 19. And they all started to run into this issue, and it became a slowdown both in execution. And I won't speak sp uh, specifically, and, and we do represent several companies involved in these deals, so I will be generic in my comments. Um, it certainly is something that has to be navigated. I can't speak to whether it's been a reason for one or more deals to collapse, but it is certainly true as you see larger deals, not only in terms of dollar value, but also footprints. So you're now dealing with mergers that involve large or relatively large MSOs compared to two years ago. They have a bigger footprint. There's more contracts to assign, leases to transfer. Everything about the process has gotten more complicated. Execution, correspondingly, has gotten more complicated. So some of these deals will fall apart, not so much because of something unique to pricing, although that's certainly issues in some cases. It can sometimes just be simple execution. The deals are more uh, complicated, harder to pull off. You're going to see more deals fail as a result. Or, or, or deals don't make sense that made sense nine months ago. And, and one thing that's been proven so far in the cannabis industry is from an M&A perspective, it's been perceived that one plus one equals three. Um, two companies come together, suddenly we have more licenses, we have more footprints, we have a bigger, we have a bigger MSO footprint, we have you know, whatever it is, we have more licenses. Um, one plus one probably equals 1.3 right now. Um, and, and in the case of that deal, um, I'm not sure it even equaled 1.3. So um, that's a really important time for the industry because, you know, you're seeing... Let's uh, look at history. Let's look at history and, in fact, talk about, you know, as someone who sees enormous amount of VC activity, um, Treehouse is certainly, you know, y you have probably 15 companies you could rattle off that are really solid, fundamentally... Uh, bottom-up great companies, they're actually making money. And you told me about a few of them last night. Um, but as someone that sat on the West Coast, worked with big media, worked with brands, um, it's all been about branding. I, I just want to get your perspective on, um, I'm again... Gonna give, the, I'm going to give you an example. The marketplace today. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. How many people in this room are active investors right now? Great. How many people are at their first cannabis conference? Great. So, and how many people thought that they would never be in this room 10 years ago? <laughs> right. That's the good news. This is a consumer-driven conversation. And what we've seen in the last, what I've seen in the last 11 years is, is a, a very mixed bag of talent trying to pull off brand management, traditional marketing and media relations, and not doing it very well. The number one uh, crash and burn in this industry that I've seen in the last 11 years is executive team divorce. So the, the leadership and the, the toolkit of the teams that are being structured and the actual structure of the companies has faltered. That's what we're seeing now. However, Annie, I'm going to ask you. Annie from the Galley's building an FDA compliant state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Santa Rosa. How many brands are you looking at that have hit your door? 
about 120, about 120 brands at her door looking for manufacturing in a Trader Joe's, Whole Foods kind of situation. That's the good news. The people out there that have been existing in this industry still know that this is a nascent industry and that this is an opportunity. This rock and roll, we all kind of suspected, but I think that the people that are out there really doing the traditional values, the traditional marketing, the traditional commodity looking, um, and just pressing forward. And one of those companies that's done that in a very quiet way, I sat with the other night uh, with Cureleaf, they have 37 stores in 11 states. But look at their stock. And truly, the same way. They're a multi-state operator. They're rocking and rolling. But it's a, it's a roller coaster of consumer conversation and understanding. But, but is, is the stock price a reflection of the business model? Is it a reflection of the capital markets? Is it a reflection of management's ability to execute? I think all three. Because I don't think the markets understand this industry because they're trying to figure it out because they're new to it. Mm -hmm. So I do think that... The, uh, that uh, even though I am on a Canadian board, Fincana Capital in Vancouver, and our friends to the north mm -hmm. uh, caused a little bit of a stir when they started to acquire three or four years ago and bought all these companies and started to, to pour all this money in. Now they're paying the price, and so are we. Well, so, and and I, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that's happened now because now federal regulation is going to come. The FDA and the DEA and the DOJ are having consistent conversations about regulatory platforms. That's a good thing. Yeah, and we, so, sh we should, sorry to cut you off, we, yeah, we should, sorry. and we should definitely get into uh, vape, FDA, and there's just so much to talk about. Um, and just quickly on Canada versus U.S. as an investment, as a trade. First of all, um, I can just tell you that most of the guys that I know that are either dedicated hedge funds or investment managers in the cannabis space uh, are trying very hard to short Canada and be long the United States in any way they can do it. And, and by the way, the capital markets as they're constructed is there's a handful of ETFs, a couple that have some size um, of, of uh, the ability to actually get a borrow and short these stocks. Um, or they're shorting whatever they can and they're short of shorting individual names. Or in many cases, and, and sometimes the guys that are the dedicated funds are also the guys that own these assets. Um, and they're doing everything they can in terms of locking in deals where um, it may be highly, highly dilutive to the underlying shareholders, but they're doing whatever they need to do right now to lock in and to hedge themselves at the great expense of their stock. So Wade, back to you as, as a guy that's been in investment banking, capital markets for a long time, you know, I'm kind of horrified by the, the disincentive of what's been going on. And this is, we're not picking on Canada, by the way. I, I think if anything, you should pick on the regulators in the United States who have created this problem. Um, that Canadian companies are in a much better position to raise capital, that the capital markets are so distorted that the only companies you can buy in the United States are, are companies that in many cases might be out of business at some point. Um, but, but wait, talk about uh, just the dynamics of, of where, as someone that is investing in companies and also building companies, it seems to me companies have been more focused on their share price because it's their only source of currency to go do deals and are totally misaligned with investors. It's, I mean, investors are basically being told, hey, we're going to do $22 million in the second quarter of 2019 um, a year ago or six months ago or two weeks ago. And then they come out and say, you know what, we're off by 40. Yeah, the forecasting has been terrible, um, to put it mildly, I guess. And... Um, but really, uh, that they've been taking a lot of capital in and they think that they're just going to do a roll-up, right? So they buy other companies and they think that's going to be the key su to success for long-term capital appreciation. But it really doesn't work that way, as you guys know. It's fundamentals. Um, they got to create a team. And sometimes they expand too fast, too, you know, too quick. And again, they don't have the infrastructure or the corporate governance to kind of back that up, uh, especially being a publicly traded company. It's much different than being private. So I just don't think a lot of the companies are really ready to be public. And I, I think that's a major issue right now that they're, you know, they're trying to make a huge splash in the industry and make a lot of money quick. But they're just not, and Brett could tell you about this, I mean, it, the corporate governance is very expensive. It's, it's hard to do. They've got the SEC filings all the time. And I just think there's, there's a big component to that that they just don't expect or understand. And then, um, you know, they, they're not really growing organically. They're trying to grow by, you know, acquisition. And I just don't think that's a way uh, for long-term success. Brent, is corporate governance good in this industry or bad? Let's let's oversimplify it and just, I'm just curious. I mean, do you think companies are doing a good job or a poor job? You're a lawyer. 
Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's it's evolving for sure. Uh, I mean, we do tons of cleanup. We get clients in that uh, don't have any ducks in a row, so we spend a lot of time getting that, you know, getting their their docs in a row, getting their filings done, get all their, make sure they have all their licenses, and getting getting their financial model in shape, getting their valuation strong before we even reach out to investors. So yeah, it, it's definitely it's getting better. It's certainly better than two years ago when I first started in the industry. But you know, there's still a, you know, a lot of work for these companies to just make sure all their ducks are in a row. And, and if you're starting a new company, start right from the get go. I mean, do all the right filings. Get your structure in place. You know, hire a lawyer, hire a CPA early in the process, and just start from from the beginning, uh, doing everything right. It makes things so much easier down the road. Scott, um, so let's get another regulatory question. Um, I'm sensing a trend here from not the head of the MGO LO Alliance, but the COO. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hear your sense of where the regulatory climate is going. Uh, we just passed the Safe Act through House. Um, there's some sense that that bill that got passed was prepared in a way that was going to make it passable with some changes in the Senate, but that that wouldn't have gone through in a, with a special vote, a two-thirds vote, if it wasn't ready for the Senate to back it. And what I'm also hearing is that there may be capital markets add-ons to something that goes through the Senate um, that might actually change the capital markets environment, the listing environment. Um, and possibly, because Gaynell's sitting next to me and she's reverberating positive energy to me, um, that, that could come this fall, not you know, after an election. I'm just curious your view. You're in the middle of this. Wow. So first it's HSR. Now it's forecasting. Uh, Come on, man. That's can, you, cannabis you, you regulatory. You came out of the panel late, so you get the tough <laughs> questions. <laughs> can, I, can I forecast the next recession? That's so much easier. Um, so, uh, you know, I th I'm not sure how many people are in the room, but I, I suspect if we took a poll there or even on this uh, panel, you'd get, in this case, uh, i got to do my math here, five different, five? Yeah, five. Count, got to count. Five different six with moderate. Six different perspectives on what's going to happen with safe, uh, states, right, et cetera. Um, so specifically to the first question you ask, um, I'm going to take a position that is a little bit different than I would have taken maybe even a month ago, 30 days ago, uh, when I was pretty optimistic it would pass in the Senate with a THC focus. I'm increasingly um, concerned that it will not pass the Senate with a THC focus and it may be watered down to be more, I'll call it hemp focused um, or low THC focused. Um, I'm a little bit shocked by that. Again, going back multiple months, I thought that the logic behind both safe and states was so compelling it would overcome political animosity, political gamesmanship. Uh, I guess with my increasing age and gray hair over the last 12 months, I am now cynical that's going to happen. So I guess if you're going to force me into a yay or nay. Is this, it, but for, for uh, you know, we're probably mostly on one side of the, the aisle in this room, although I don't know. Um, this is a bipartisan issue. Why, why is this political wrangling? Why is, I mean, this could be classic uh, local constituency wrangling, uh, but not necessarily there's an ideology that is unacceptable right. to one group. I think somebody up here talked about, or multiple people talked about fragmented industry. I think when you talk about these bills, you also have fragmented politics. So it's not just left, right, or Democrat, Republican. It's a wide variety. It's social justice versus other aspects. So sure. you have all these countervailing uh, weights. I'm not sure there's going to be enough consensus to make it happen. In okay. So Tim, I just want to comment on this. I'm working with two lobbyists, look these ladies up, Twin Logic Strategies. They are a Republican and a Democrat. They've formed a access and innovation regulatory framework. They've taken it up both sides of the aisle since January, meaning the the 30,000 foot view of federal legislation. What's it going to look like? Who's going to have be a stakeholder? And uh, one of very conservative senators said to them the other day, they, they called me and said, well, here's the deal. They are talking about this. Everyone's talking about this. This is a, one of the number one wellness topics of conversations at every dinner party I've been going to for the last two years. But the problem is, on both sides of the aisle, it is not at the top of their list because of what the political climate that we are currently in. So the, it's just not a priority is what they're finding out. So our intention with this initiative, by the way, is to train the new 100 women of Congress and their communications officers of how to talk about cannabis and wellness as lifestyle, as well as a little bit about pay, 
pay, pay gender equity. Okay, so but we're, but this is going to be talked about, and they have been talking about this for nine months on both sides of the aisle. And there's a willingness of conversation, but the temperature is so hot right now, it's just not at the top of the list. Well, and it, it sounds like what you're saying is you're just trying to find um, different characterizations of what this is to make it more appealing to more people. That's so if you correct. get into lifestyle and you get into wellness, you get into uh, more palatable and broader constituency. So, so, so uh, Sumit, let's bring it back to investing. So, and in fact, lifestyle, wellness, uh, federally legal, uh, things that actually can raise capital in a more traditional environment, things that actually uh, institutions can own who have a some type of a municipal mandate. Um, what 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 do you like here? I mean, and and I guess you know I want everybody's view on this, but we're let's get back to investment trends. I mean, not only what are the trends in the subsectors, but we're we're talking about a market where public or private um, valuations are contracting by the second. Mm -hmm. Is now a good time? Is in other words, it's a great time to have money in your pocket, but will it be a better time in six months to have money in your pocket? So there are 32,000 private companies, 350 public companies. The public companies get an overwhelming majority of the news uh, cycle in terms of coverage. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to look at private companies. We've never, we've never touched public companies in the space. They've been at 60 to 600 times sales, just not in our wheelhouse. We expected this. To us, this is a very sort of rational part of an emerging market moving toward maturity. Uh, in terms of what we like, from a global standpoint, we're moving, we've moved away from, from Canada. I think Canada, from an investment standpoint, uh, ought to be invested in for its IP, not its cultivation. In the history of the world, I don't know if Canada has ever been known to have grown anything besides maybe maple trees and hockey players. Hockey players. <laughs> uh, yeah, good ones. We are looking at China. It produces more hemp than the rest of the world combined. We talk about China as the, emerging, the global cannabis superpower. They've started issuing licenses. India has started issuing licenses. Every third human lives in one of those two countries. It's important to park some capital there. They're limited license uh, countries with extremely large populations with no traditional, uh, with no traditional ban against hemp. And in India, specifically, cannabis was illegalized in 1985. So there's a very strong cultural significance to having cannabis available. Uh, for for everyone in, in the country. In fact, Ayurveda is based a lot on cannabis. Right. Uh, from a domestic standpoint, I would look at whether or not cannabis will remain in balkanized state marketplaces like it is today, and think about whether there's a single federally legal substance anyone can name that is illegal to transport across state borders. Why would cannabis be the first? So if you're looking at total addressable markets for your investments, it's important to think about a fully globally agriculturally traded marketplace if you're making long-term investments. That's local restrictions upon how it's... And, and, and that's great news for a lot of companies, by the way. Let's be clear. I mean, there's a lot of companies either that you all are involved in or invested in that don't want to see uh, that, that federal restriction drop because these companies are dead. So... Um, uh, and globally, the framework is, is so much more open. So Treehouse Global Ventures, we're looking at Poland, we're looking at Greece, we're looking at Portugal, places that traditionally have more ease of, frame, of regulatory framework. That's strange to hear the EU being thought of as a place with less regulation. Yeah. Um, and, and, well, it's true in Poland and Portugal. But it brings up a good point, and to tackle this whoever wants it, but you know, as much as... Uh, you know, I've been a global investor my whole career and spent a lot of time in emerging markets, spent a lot of time in Europe. So when I hear that Macedonia has a cost advantage in terms of labor force and in terms of uh, obviously just natural conditions where they should be a, they should be a go-to place to produce cannabis uh, and they are becoming one. I also hear that the ability to get the licenses and get uh, GMP certification and get proper uh, pathway into distribution into Western Europe is a lot longer than what people think. So uh, in a world where, let's pick on Canada only because I think this is what's made sense about some of the Canadian valuations, so I'm complimenting them at the same time. They've had valuations that have been based upon having a global footprint, right? They've had valuations that have been based upon, hey, we're in Germany, we're in Poland, um, we're in Portugal producing into, and we all know who they are and what they're saying they can do. Um, I think this is a lot like you know, people just assuming we're going to see the next gold rush and why not play the same trade? And I don't think it's going to happen the same way again. Does anybody have a view? I don't, as much as Europe, we all know 
what the EU as a, as a consumer force in the global economy is. Um, and how sophisticated towards cannabis, in fact, and ahead of the game, the, the EU has been. Um, I'm not sure this market is as wide open as people think it is. Does anybody want to touch this? I think Wall Street estimates are still about 30% too high. And a lot of Canadian valuation uh, euphoria was based on countries like Germany importing. I don't know why Germany would continue to import plants from Canada that cost 250 bucks a pound when they can do it from Colombia at 25 bucks a pound. Right. Wade, do you have a view on this? Um, I'm actually a little bit different. I don't. I, we won't look at anything outside the United That's States right now. Good point. Um, we just think Why right bother? now for us, it, it's close proximity to you know our investments in California or Oregon or or Colorado. Um, we got to touch and feel management. We got to sit with them, kind of help them and guide them. But um, I, I also just think there's going to be a um, uh, a real um, worldwide. Um, what am I trying to say? Is basically that. Other countries are going to want a U.S. product, right? Same with corn or almonds or whatnot, right? They're going to want U.S. grown hemp. Um, and so that's kind of what we're playing. We're playing in the U.S. hemp space, and we're trying to maybe export um, hemp out of the country as opposed to importing it in. We currently were buying some uh, CBD isolate and flour from uh, China, and we tested it and came back with uh, pesticides and heavy metals and leads. So, again, that's just something that we want to avoid, um, you know, China is very unregulated with all their products, as we know, and so the vapes are coming from there, and so the pods and, and the vape park cartridges are coming from China. So we're trying to stay U.S., and um, that's been our focus. Yeah, I think it's a complicated answer because you talked about, for example, with Macedonia or some other locations that have climate or other geographic factors. But when you talk about a marketplace evolving, uh, not only does that come into play, but it's also regulatory, social, political climate. Those are all hard to predict and vary region by region. So you might have the best uh, location from a pure climate or geography, but uh, depending on the social acceptance, the legal environment, you know, that may not come to bear. So I think you're, you're going to see different answers in different parts of the country. And in some places you might look at and say, why didn't that region become a hemp or cannabis center? And you'll look back 10 years later and you'll be trying to figure it out maybe because of those very factors. But I don't think it's going to evolve uh, logically, just as things have not evolved logically in the U.S., I think you'll see some of that same ill logic play out uh, globally. And that's all the more reason to, look, as Treehouse is doing, is looking at the picks and shovels like Mark Twain said in the very beginning. There's plenty of space for technology platforms, for HR, for accounting, for legal, for support services, ancillary businesses that need to help to build to scale. So I think that's a good opportunity. So, okay, so, and we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to, again, get back into just some, some, some closing points on how you folks are investing or would advise um, let's, again, let's break it down because uh, public-private is always a big debate. Um, and while it's easy to quickly see where the public markets have gone, um, private markets have done something similar. It's also just, you know, one of the things just everyone needs to think about is one of the things that's going on in the private market is the same thing that's going on in the IPO market. Um, and the cannabis industry has had a couple moments in its, in its uh, young life to uh, be affected by the exogenous factors of global markets. But we all know that the IPO market for, uh, deal, for story stocks is broken, and it probably should be broken. Um, that may be easy to say today, um, but the reality of we all know what's happened in terms of failed IPOs. Um, cannabis stories are story stocks as well, especially for companies that are not structurally profitable. Um, that can take place in public or private. The private market is very sophisticated, and it's one of the reasons why these big unicorns have been able to exist the way they have is because you can make an argument that they're more sophisticated, even though the analysis done on some of these names. So I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. I'll just ask you folks, in terms of how deals are getting done right now and the structures that are most interesting, um, whether it's public or private, um, and then also uh, in terms of the deal structures, uh, a lot of companies are being priced as a function of earnouts and true performance and where they're going to be on EBITDA, um, certainly on top line. Um, are you tying those things into your deals? Because if you have money to spend right now, you can pretty much ask for anything you want. Anybody have a view? Do you want to just work? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Here. Do you want to... Whoever's ready to go. I'll, I'll jump in. So go for it. A couple of broad comments. So number one, um, 
You know, we do think that uh, private is the way to go right now. If we have a client that uh, absolutely wants to go public, uh, we'll support them, but we also want to make very, very sure that they know why they're doing it. Uh, we think, but we are pushing people that come to us that are on the fence to stay private, both for uh, ease of having time to mature as a company, but also we believe it ultimately gives them more financing vehicles to choose from once you're on the public markets, starts to limit what you do for your second, third rounds, et cetera. So that's point number one. Point number two, we think the reduction in valuation is going to significantly increase the amount of private capital that comes in. Previously, a lot of institutional money had no incentive to do due diligence on the industry when the valuations were so high because they could look at it and say, there's no way I'm going to make money. At a reduced valuation, they can look at it objectively and say, this is an asset class I can make money off of. Now let me do my due diligence about the regulatory legal issues and see whether or not it's a fit for me, my fund, my LPs, et cetera. Uh, third point relating to the M&A environment, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. um, deals are still going to get done. As, we, as I commented earlier, those deals are more complex or more complicated. So it's more important that the companies that enter those deals have advisors and a team that they trust. And it sounds like a shameless pitch, and it is a little bit. Uh, but the rea reality is... After all, your boss is in the audience. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but the reality is, and we'll tell people if they end up not working with us, like, hey, if you don't use us, make sure you use somebody that knows the industry, knows the industry and knows execution. Because the industry is so young, uh, historically on the professional service side, you had maybe one of two types. You had new entrants who didn't understand the in industry, but they had previously done other deals. Or you had people who knew the industry but had no experience in execution. So it's important that whoever you work with, that they hit both those points. Great points. And we're looking at private as well. We're a private equity firm. We're not looking at seed. We're only looking at scale. And so I'm happy to say that a lot of women and minority-led companies that we are looking at are in positive revenue. Maybe not, you know, seven figures, but they're, you know, they're getting there. So they're just very slowly building their platforms, and uh, it's nice to see. They're also talent from Silicon Valley, talent from Estelotter, talent from other industries that have the toolkit that know how to scale. Subit? So I started my career at Merrill in 96, and I left JP Morgan in 2016, so 20 years on Wall Street. Over that time frame, if you look at the number of public companies, it's been cut in half. So the private marketplace in the U.S. has expanded quite dramatically. Cannabis is no exception. When we think about how to allocate amongst cannabis, we go back to traditional Wall Street tenants, diversification, hedging, et cetera. So we start by looking at allocating across the five main sectors of cannabis, which in a, a rising stepladder of risk, go from real estate to hemp to ancillary to plant touching to international. We'll then introduce subsector tactical tilts in our portfolios before we go do bottom-up analysis, which is still valid. We look at cash flows. We look at basic fundamentals. We have a macro view as to where, where individual companies are going, but they have to place into an overall macro top-down portfolio viewpoint before we ever start uh, allocating capital into them. I, I think there's, it's probably pretty obvious uh, to you most people, there are certain parts, subsectors, subverticals of the cannabis industry and the hemp industries that are inherently more profitable than others. Um, are, are the ones that are profitable falling into a particular subvertical? I mean, it's really as simple as are we, you know, I'm not going to look at this and yeah, you know what, show me whatever you got on that. Whoever brings you deals, however you source them, I'll, I'll look at that. You know, what, where, where is that? So the cannabis industry, for some reason, has become vertically integrated in many cases. That's not true for almost any, it other, has to be. any other sector. It, it has to be in certain areas. It doesn't have to be in all. And if you're, for example, investing in a brewery, you're not investing in the farm that grew their, their wheat or their corn or, or, their, uh, or their hops. Somehow this industry has changed. Now we're starting to see margins normalize at both ends of the supply chain. So if we look at M&A activity, it's climbed more rapidly in cultivation and retail than any other space. And I suspect that as we mature in the supply chain, folks are going to be buying cannabis more based on brand and less based on strain, which is the case at the moment. And when you can capture mind share, you have a hope of capturing wallet share. So with manufacturing and branding, that's where we see margins, uh, margins staying healthy over the long term. The other thing I'd mention is the way we hedge against the impending and perhaps precipitous declines in the spot prices of isolate, distillate, and, and biomass yeah. is by looking at the companies that are using these, these items as components rather than uh, revenue drivers. So as the price of cannabis falls, is it impacting your revenue negatively or your COGS positively? Yeah, in many and cases. And if you can have shelf price Bullish. relative inelasticity, then we see margins expanding as COGS continue to, to decline. Um, 
By the way, I hadn't seen uh, Jill yet to give me my kill switch, so I thought we were just going to go on forever, but we don't have a lot of time left. Um, Brent, what are the most interesting structures you guys are working on or seeing right now for new deals? So we, uh, real quick on the public versus private thing, you know, uh, in my Silicon Valley days, first of all, we never even considered taking a company, company public until it's gone through at least a few rounds of private equity financing and probably three to four years in, into its lifespan. So trying to think of taking a public company or taking a company public in 18 months and doing a quick turn, uh, it's almost akin to gambling. Um, and so when I, when I counsel my clients, um, you know, you don't always want to go public. For the companies or the investors? I mean, it, What's it, that? It, it's, it's, it's been like investing in a casino for investors, especially with the cap structures that have both lockups and sure. warrants and very dilutive elements to them. Yeah, and so, you know, as far as, uh, and I guess I think about it from, you know, a lot of our, our, our clients are our companies looking to raise money. Yeah. And so, you know, when they say, hey, I want, I want to go public in 18 months, yeah, we really try to talk them through the, the benefits of private financing, uh, building the fundamentals. Uh, and, and most oftentimes on an exit, you'll get more out of a company on a, on a private exit than you will taking it public. And so we just make, make sure they understand the pluses and minuses of public versus versus private. You know, as far as structures, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot more, uh, you know, preferred stock financings. Uh, investors yep. are, are in a space to get uh, better terms yep. uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, dividends and, and uh, anti-dilution rights uh, on convertible note financings. You know, investors, are again, are, they're in the, in the spot. They're getting better discounts. They're getting better uh, valuation caps. Um, so it's definitely an investor's market. Um, but also, it all comes down to valuation, right? And there are so many things in the industry that affect valuation, a lot of which is just really understanding the regulatory uh, issues and, and the, the constraints in which these companies are operating. Wait, finish this off here. Um, for us, we're looking mostly in private companies, and what we're trying to do is invest in the whole supply chain, like someone was saying. So we're investing in uh, industrial hemp farms now in California, in uh, Nevada, uh, extraction, uh, controlling that, and then um, wholesale distribution, white labeling, formulation. So we're trying to control the whole supply chain as well so we can keep our cogs low. Um, so to your point was is that you were asking what space is hot um, I would say there's good companies in every vertical every portion of that supply chain but again that's probably 10 percent the other 90 percent are you know going to go out of business so um, we're trying to align ourselves with good people good companies good ma management teams that we think we could help them expand um, and so we think uh, the farming and the extraction in the industrial hemp space is really um, it's a real boom right now for us so um, we're looking at that that right, makes sense. Um, um, okay, so 90% of the companies are going to go out of business, according to Wade. Um, <laughs> leave it on a positive note. No, just kidding. Um, truly an interesting discussion, and the, 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 the sobriety in which this panel is approaching their jobs for their fiduciaries is, is, is critical. It's not just commendable, it's critical. And it's why they're doing what they're doing and being successful at it. Um, so uh, I'm glad we've had a chance to talk about the complexity of the environment, which is changing by the day. And if we sat here six months ago, it would be a very different discussion, as we know it will be six months from now. So thank you all very much. Wade, Brent, Scott, Sumit, Danielle, thank you very much. I don't need your mic. I mean, oh, Scott, was that light bothering you?